Uh, before I kick off here, I'd like to just show a short video that introduces the work that we've been doing at the World Economic Forum around the globalization of knowledge. So we'll kick that off. How are migration, climate change, and education connected? How will the fourth industrial revolution, social innovation, and aging populations affect the future role of government? In an increasingly complex world, these connections can be hard to see, yet a systemic understanding of global issues is essential to today's leaders. As a global platform for multi-stakeholder cooperation, the World Economic Forum has developed a framework to analyze the interconnections among diverse topics, illustrating how developments in one area can impact others. By drawing on the collective intelligence of the forum's networks, transformation maps explain the factors driving change across industries, economies, and global issues. For example, by disrupting every aspect of technology, the fourth industrial revolution will have a profound impact on governance and affect the scale and character of conflict. Both will test the role of government, which will also have to take into account the challenges posed by aging populations in advanced economies. Great. So I'd like to now walk through three elements that underpin what we just highlighted there in the video. First is the aspect of the global network, the role and value of contextual awareness, and last, hybrid intelligence. And if we walk into each of those three, we can see here what happens when you actually bring together a global network. Now, Many of you are probably familiar with the philosopher Frederick Hayek and his essay on use of knowledge in society that he published all the way back in 1946, in which he posited that no single individual organization can have a monopoly on knowledge because there's always more knowledge outside your institution than inside it. Now, we fast forward to 2017, and I wonder if he would have anticipated what happens when you bring together 800 experts from all over the world uh, and actually working together from different geographies, different backgrounds, to co-create knowledge as a public good. So here on my left, I have what we call a transformation map in Arabic that's been created by our partners at the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology on artificial intelligence and robotics. Here we have a map on Colombia in Japanese this was created with our partners at the Inter-American Development Bank and used to actually shape policy in Colombia with the president and his cabinet. And you know, helping understand what's the transformation look like in Colombia. Here is a map on 3D printed printing created in my home country with the University or ETH Zurich. And when we start actually thinking around, well, what does 3D printing look like? We only have to go down the street here in Dubai, and we can see the offices of our partner, the Dubai Future Foundation, that actually has 3D printed offices that they work from. And you can, again, come to other examples here on the future of government in Spanish, done with our partner, the National University of Singapore, in which case we think, well, OK, future of government, all those following the news here know that Dubai just announced the first minister of artificial intelligence in the world, right? Korea has an entire, uh, basically, ministry on the fourth industrial revolution. We start thinking what it means to transform government. Last, we have a map in Chinese on arts and culture done with our partner, the Smithsonian's institution. Again, this is the capability to pull all these pieces together through a global network and not only produce from a global pool of expertise, but make it consumable in multiple languages in any geography with an internet connection. Now, if we go to another example here, and we think about the role of contextual awareness. And you notice within each map, there's an inner ring and an outer ring. Here, we've been inspired by the work from Mark Granovetter on the power of weak signals uh, coming out of UC Berkeley. And both of these maps are on migration, one in English, the second in Arabic. Now, if you think about the relationship in migration between you know, the uh, data and analytics 
and international security, it looks very different if you're a voter in Germany, if you're a business leader in the UK, than it does if you're a policymaker in Jordan or an educator in Egypt. You know, same issues, same topics, very different perspectives. And now we can actually start to connect those dots together. Last area I'd like to draw attention to is this tension between machine intelligence and human intelligence. Today, machines can do many things much faster and much better than any human being. With the Transformation Map Framework, we're able to monitor hundreds of high quality sources, synth synthesize and summarize the content emerging from those sources, and make it available with a machine translated summary. Yet, in an era of fake news, elections that have been questioned, we also say, well, where's the human role in here? Are we actually ready to delegate everything to an algorithm? And I think the answer is definitely not yet, right? There's still definitely a role uh, to think about the role of humans here. And in this case, we actually have the ability to synthesize this information with human curation. So it's the hybrid intelligence that combines the capabilities and power of the machines, but with the judgment and sensibility of human curation. So we think all of these are three important elements that we need to take into consideration as we advance into the fourth industrial revolution. Last area, we're going to kick off with a panel, a number of panelists here. And as my colleagues start to prepare this stage, uh, I invite everyone online uh, to go to weft.ch slash knowledge, and you can access all of the maps uh, in five languages across 130 different areas. And um, you can do the same in the audience. So we'll just play a little music here while they get the stage set up. Thank you.
Building on this, uh, uh, what we've just um, were able to see here and the work that we've been doing at the World Economic Forum, we'd like to now have a little bit of a discussion on the role of knowledge in the context of the fourth industrial revolution and the way in which uh, we may think about uh, the increasing ubiquitousness of, of information, um, how we can uh, ensure that in that context knowledge continues to bring people together, empowers people, informs evidence-based decision-making, uh, and the kind of considerations we need to have as machines and humans increasingly uh, uh, coexist um, in the creation of knowledge. So we have a stellar cast uh, of panelists here with us to, uh, to discuss this. I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, we want to make this an interactive discussion uh, with you here in the audience, so don't hesitate to uh, interrupt at any point. Uh, give me a signal, and I'll bring you into the, into the conversation. Um, but to my immediate left, I have uh, uh, Subra Suresh, who is the incoming president of Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Then we have uh, Catherine Mayer, who is the executive director of Wikimedia Foundation, uh, followed by Catherine Mulligan, uh, who is a co-director of the Cryptocurrency Research Center at Imperial College in London. Uh, Louis Ross, uh, Senior Advisor for Innovation and Digital Economy uh, at the Office of the President of the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, and finally, um, Abdul Salam Haikal, CEO of Haikal Media, also the publishers of uh, Harvard Business Review Arabia. Now, all the panelists are directly or indirectly contributing to this effort that uh, uh, we've shown you, so we're excited uh, and extremely pleased to have you with us. Um, but if we think about this notion of knowledge in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, Subra, um, as a president of a university, how are you thinking about uh, this, this transformation of the creation of knowledge um, in, in the role of universities um, in, in the context of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, universities always have played a major role because the time constant for the universities is much longer than the time constant for industry. So, academia has the luxury to ask questions that push the boundaries of human intellect over a time horizon that the industry does not have the luxury to do. So that's the first point. Second, universities, uh, through training of students, through exploration, through research, create new knowledge, in addition to teaching and educating large numbers of students. Mm -hmm. But the fourth industrial revolution brings to the fore um, some very intriguing questions about education itself and about knowledge creation itself. For example, the pace of change in the fourth industrial revolution is so large and the convergence of the physical, the digital, and the biological world, worlds is so profound, how do you educate a student in four years who is well prepared to be a good citizen of the world in the 21st century? That's an interesting question. The other interesting question is, uh, uh, how do you educate a young individual to, make, to be prepared to make decisions in the face of uncertainty and in the face of huge amounts of data based on evidence than based on prior techniques. Third, if you're majoring in computer science, what is the minimum knowledge of social sciences and literature and music that you're supposed to know? But equally, if you're a literature major or a music major, what is the minimum amount of coding that you are expected to know to be a successful citizen of the 21st century? That question has never been asked before in the previous industrial revolutions. And then there are, a f the last point I want to make is that when we teach them, whether it's science or literature or music, inevitably for the fourth industrial revolution, there is a convergence of ethics, uh, policy, et cetera, which is much more profound than in the previous industrial re revolution. So how do you incorporate that so that a young graduate of a, of a university can be a productive citizen of the world for decades to come? Excellent. Thank you, Subra. And uh, this really uh, transitions nicely to you, Catherine, because you're making knowledge available to all, right? If information and knowledge is available to all, 
how do we prioritize what is important and how do we build that trust in, in, in information? How are you thinking about that? Sure. So Okay. Um, I think that the way that Wikimedia works is that communities themselves decide what knowledge is important. And I think that that's critical to the whole idea of representation and equity that needs to exist within globalized knowledge systems. Um, information that is widely available, ranging from the sort of mundane or and the ephemeral around pop culture, that that is information that reflects the human condition just as much as sort of high-minded knowledge around um, the origins of Western philosophy or you know the Vedic texts, and we don't want to discriminate against certain types of information because those are types of information that connect us to ourselves and to our societies. We think a lot about how knowledge can solve problems, but also how knowledge can stir the soul because it is that sort of aspect of human inspiration and understanding that really allows us to have empathy for one another and understand the places that we come from. And I think that as we go into the future, we've been talking a lot throughout the sessions today about finding common consensus in what feels like, a, at the moment, a very fragmented uh, world or a very fractured world. And it's by returning to the sort of the understanding of the self and our common shared cultures that we can hopefully find some places to be able to move forward those conversations. We've been thinking a lot about the concept of knowledge equity and how, as we move into this more globalized future where more people do have access to information and are hopefully participating in the process of information creation, um, we ensure that you have really meaningful representation across different languages, but also sort of what is contained within knowledge. Uh, and, and this is something that I think is really critical as we, as we do look to a world in which, as we saw from the knowledge maps, you know, different regions have different challenges, different regions have different priorities and needs, making sure that the information that those regions and those individuals and those sort of communities have is suitable to the challenges that they are looking to solve. Mm. And I mean, a really sort of tangible example of this is on, um, on Wikipedia itself, we know that for example, since we're in Dubai, only 3% of the web's content is in Arabic, and yet 20% of Arabic speakers speak a second language. So you're talking about 80% of the Arabic-speaking world that only has access to 3% of the entire web. That feels like a really significant challenge as we think about what does advancement look like in a region um, that has such great potential and yet seems to lack access to fundamental resources. And so this is something that is an area with really sort of tangible opportunity um, that we can focus our efforts on. Right, right. Maybe just to build on this, this point of the availability of uh, um, Arabic content, I, I feel I have to bring in uh, uh, Abdul Salam here because you are actually, with your organization, bringing uh, content uh, into Arabic language. Uh, you've been contributing to the, the Arabic version of, uh, of, of, of these maps. Um, what do you say to, uh, to, to, to Catherine's point here about uh, the, the availability of content in well, the region? Um, um, first, I'm uh, actually thrilled that the World Economic Forum decided to have the maps in local languages because this is the way that you, you can actually make the impact that you want through local communities. And there is no community that can absorb knowledge and consume it in the same way that it does in its language, uh, like it's uh, the global language that is English, or I might argue global language is actually bad English, so this is the language that people communicate uh, with. But y you look at, I mean, the, the essence of this meeting today and many of the meetings that happen in, uh, in Dubai with the vision that Dubai and the UAE have, has, uh, it is about creating growth and employment through uh, knowledge-intensive activities. And Knowledge-intensive activities have to be based on, on knowledge, and knowledge has to be available in the, in, in, in the language of, of the country. Now, you look at a country like the UAE, people are dual-lingual, so it's easy for them to, to probably consume uh, knowledge and information, but the rest of the Arab world is not. The rest, I mean, the large Arab countries, including Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, some countries that are probably not thought of uh, right now because of turmoil, Iraq, Syria, North Africa, the language is Arabic. So there is also this myth that there is not one language in the Arab world. And I think it's a myth. Why? Because all Arab people from Morocco to Oman uh, read news in the same Arabic. They read Wikipedia in the same Arabic, which is modern standard Arabic, al-Fusha. 
the official paperwork is in the same language. Instruction at school is in the same language. So it's not a language that you speak daily, you speak Lajat Lamiya, the, the local dialect, but this is a language that is a common base for, for the region. So now if we, if we really want to, to make use of the opportunity that is available, the fourth industrial revolution, all the technologies that have become available to humankind, uh, effort like yours, uh, content like Harvard Business Review, Popular Science, MIT Technology Review, and these, these are things we publish. Uh, you say that if I really want this region to, to make that leap, then information has to be available, and then you deal with the other challenge, which is, do we have the terms for some of these English terms in Arabic, the Arabic equivalents? And like, like, uh, like you said now, it is, uh, change is happening at a pace that we're still trying to cope with. But in the past, we came up with terms in Arabic that are great and they've been used, and there are Arabic words, including, for, for example, the Arabs did not invent the car, but we call it sayyara, we don't call it car. We did not invent the train, we call it qatar. We don't invent uh, the generator, we call it muwallida so, or midakha. So we use these words and there have been very successful localization of, of, uh, of foreign terms or terms that were generated in that language. So I really believe there is an opportunity to to invest in creating a knowledge creation industry in the Arab world. The knowledge creation industry is broken. So part of it is universities, part of it is schools, and it is easier today to start a, a university that does delivery in English, because you'll find the ecosystem is there for it. The textbooks are there, the professors are there, administration is there, a best standard is there, and it is all in, in a foreign language. Uh, but you have visionary institutions in this country, and I think the spillovers are happening because they're thinking that we need to actually push knowledge and science in Arabic too. That includes the Dubai Future Foundation. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, when they come to us and say, we want to work with you on publishing popular science to bring it to Arabic, we want to bring the MIT Technology Review, so that innovation in, in our part of the world is not only limited to soft innovation. So you bring hardcore engineering and science into the mix and then invite people to act and probably be inspired by what they've read and been exposed to. So this is the opportunity uh, uh, that I think is available uh, for us now. Right. So the importance of that localization, local context. And I'd like to uh, in a, uh, come back a little bit later to the, uh, what the potential of technology has on, 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 on the significance of language. But before I do that, um, let, me, let me turn to uh, Catherine uh, Mulligan. You're on the uh, Council on the Future of Blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, a technologist at the leading edge of technology. Can we, um, can we turn or trust uh, technology to help us deal with this ubiquitous information, building trust? Will technology help us or will it, will it hinder? What, what, how, how do you look at that? Yeah, so I, I think very much that technology is a double-edged sword. It has given us both huge amounts of more information, but it's also giving us the tools to help us manage and control that information a little bit better. So if we think about it, um, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to combine uh, knowledge and uh, work from different disciplines. So I think the interdisciplinarity approach that um, my... Uh, Zuresh just uh, mentioned, is actually hugely important. And technology can really help us do that well. So one example of that is um, if you look at the field of economics, we have now huge amounts of big data available, which may help us improve if we do uh, improve our understanding and knowledge of um, economic theory. So we could use digital technologies to help us create new economic theories. That's one way we can think about doing it. Um, the other thing that we can think about is, you know, for example, new techniques for analysis and new frameworks for analyzing data. Um, one of the things that I'd like to see very much is the use of uh, all of these new sort of information and technologies to uh, reinforce the scientific method, if you will. So reinforce what we know is a good method for proving things. I think the, one, one of the downsides of information that we've seen, obviously, that's been touched on um, today as well, is the fact that it can quite often 
give us, for example, you know, uh, problems with our elections or fake news or any of these kind of things. So how do we help educate people, not just the undergraduates, but how do we help a continuing education process over life that helps people identify what is a robust piece of knowledge and a robust um, uh, analysis, if you will. So obviously uh, blockchain is touted quite a lot in, in this uh, and it can be used very effectively to help us track and trace the integrity of the data that has been used within an analytical process. So for example, we need, if we're using IoT in order to analyze our economic data, so the sensors that are out in our society, in our urban environment, how do we prove irrefutably that that data is the data that has come from that particular sensor, that it hasn't been tampered with, that it is, uh, you know, sort of has high integrity? How do we make sure that the people who are providing that analysis are the people that, you know, are the experts in that? So blockchain can help us with those kind of things, uh, to track and trace and provide that um, immutability of that record. Um, so uh, the other thing that I think, the final thing, piece that I think it can help us with is uh, I often use um, information and data to try and help prevent my own confirmation bias. So I will go out and actively seek sources that will challenge my confirmation bias. You know, I am a technology geek. I have a true belief in technology, but that's not necessarily always the point. So there you go. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. So the technology that uh, reinforces a scientific method, uh, interesting. Um, to, to, to come back to. Uh, but, uh, Louis, um, the role of international organizations um, in, in adopting this, this um, in new technologies and, and, and making um, knowledge available so, so um, that people can be empowered and brought together. How, how, how are you looking at that from the perspective of an inter-American inter development bank? Well, listen, I think this is a fascinating conversation because as a development bank, uh, particularly for Latin America, we are the largest one. We do about $13 billion a year in financing for the public sector and the private sector, right? But what we have learned over time is that the value proposition that we bring to the clients is not so much the financial resource, but are the non-financial resource, right? I mean, more and more financial resource becomes a commodity where the, you know, capital markets are well developed. Some of our countries have you know, graduated to middle-income countries, so need less of that finance for the infrastructure for schools, for hospitals. And so they see a lot more value on the knowledge. But we ourselves had to reorganize the institution to put value on knowledge, to organize ourselves. Should that become a core asset that we can share to the region? So we begin to focus a lot more on how do we invest in our own people? You know, how do we train them? How do we build capacity? So there is a big shift internally to not focus so much on, on our operations, but a lot more knowledge. Also, a lot of the mechanisms that we have in engaging our clients, you know, not only the operations, but country dialogues. We sit down with ministers, vice ministers. So bringing to them knowledge was absolutely key, right? So reorganizing ourselves around that was important. And so the other part that for us was critical is that how do we become more of a curator of knowledge rather than a producer of knowledge? I mean, the IDB is very proud as every other development bank to produce knowledge that we own and, you know, very smart economies, all of us. Um, but the question here is that in a world that so much knowledge is being produced, how do we become a curator of knowledge? How do we bring that together through channels that can be distributed, that can be understood? So we are moving towards that you know, in, a, in an important way. And then, of course, we focus on publications, on data. Uh, we develop a massive online courses. We have 40 of them now. We actually just launched the digital economy one. It's the first massive online course that we did on digital economy. We're the first ones to have massive online course on Portuguese and Spanish, because this was important. I mean, we talked about local context and local content. I mean, it's very important for us to develop. And then in this context, uh, the transformation maps and the partnership that we do with you uh, with the WEF is absolutely key because more and more countries need um, country-specific information, you know, that is relevant for their context. But more important, when you look at the digital transformation that is happening, it's so overwhelming for countries and for the private sector, for civil society, that if you don't offer them a framework, an analytical framework, just like you presented, to connect the dots, 
they get overwhelmed. And what happens when you're overwhelmed? You just stop it. You freeze. You don't do anything, right? So how do we help countries to really jump into the digital revolution? And how do we help them to, to have a smooth entering in this? How do you operate that? So that guidance, that brokering, the IDB is willing to do it and is organizing ourselves. I mean, we are organizing ourselves to do that because the ultimate mission is not to transform the IDB. It should the IDB be a conduit of change for Latin American region. I mean, the ultimate goal is that the Latin American countries and the Caribbean countries really participate, as the president says, this time as winners and not as losers. Because in the Industrial Revolution, we somehow didn't come out of that as winners. So in the digital revolution, we have to be prepared, Latin America as a region, to participate actively into it and come out of that as a winner, right? So that's the mission of the bank and how we place knowledge as a core product for the bank is, is absolutely key. And we're going to advance ourselves into that. And we're actually right now reorganizing ourselves to bring knowledge, innovation, and communication all under the same group to push that transformation for the region. Thank you. Abdul Salam, coming back to this uh, uh, question of uh, the importance of language and, and, and local context, um, to what extent do you look to technology for that? Um, and, and to what extent is technology helpful um, in, in overcoming some of these, uh, these challenges of the availability of content and so on? Uh, well, I, I think we have uh, a unique opportunity now because of technology and because of the availability of tools to, uh, to gather data and then analyze data. And uh, a lot of uh, what, what language needs to grow as a language is based on its morphology and how people use it over time and how they adopt foreign words. And Arabic in the past was a lot more flexible. So you have words in Arabic today that are from, the, from Persian and uh, from other languages. Uh, we do not have that flexibility today. Uh, so looking at trends and what people use on social media and what, what they use to generate content can be very, very helpful uh, today, especially in, in coming up with, with, with new terms. So you can actually test whether something is working with a population or not. And at the same time, I mean, we have data now. We've, uh, we, have, we have a project that we've been working on for two years. We've crawled the Arabic web. We've indexed it. We've classified it. And uh, we know what percentage of, uh, of, of, of content is generated in, e in even local dialects in each of the Arab countries. So we know how much is generated in MSA and how much is generated in, in these uh, local dialects. So language can be extremely helpful, especially when you, when you so if you want to create an industry, content industry, knowledge creation industry, there are two parts. The first part is content, so you need to create it. The second part is distribution. And for a very long while, distribution has been broken in, in our part of the world. I mean, it is one Arab world uh, on the map, but it is actually 22 or 23 countries, 22 and 23 different uh, jurisdictions. Again, look at something that the Dubai Future Foundation is doing, because this is a live example. They say we want to create science content in Arabic. Now, people are going to consume it here for sure, and this is a national agenda for them, but at the same time, the spillovers are regional, because content that is available online in Dubai is available also in Saudi Arabia, is available in Egypt, is available everywhere. And then you'll find people consuming it uh, all over, all over that, uh, that, that um, our region. So I think this is really, it is a unique opportunity today that we didn't, it wasn't available to us before. And that's why uh, it is important to try and keep up with the pace. So you need not only organizations that are pushing content or producing content like us or uh, 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 only uh, uh, probably having it as a national agenda is definitely good like they, they do in the UAE. But also we need to think of long-term projects, of how to actually coin new terms that makes it easier for people to think about blockchain, to think about artificial intelligence, to think about space in their own language. Because then you start uh, teaching it from early, from early age to kids, 
and then as they grow up, they're using the same terms. Otherwise, the other option that we have, I am afraid, is to go and change the language in the region to English. So that is, that is another option, and it is, we need to look at cost efficiency and, uh, and time efficiency, uh, and then I think it will be easier to actually produce content in Arabic. That's good quality content. Thank you. Subra, you wanted to come in on that. So I, I wanted to take a particular example of uh, language learning and technology in, in uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0. You may know that there is a, uh, a free app on iPhone as well as Android called Duolingo. Yep. It's learning between two languages. I want to use it as an example of an experiment that was done recently. So they have 90 million or 100 million registered users, two-thirds of them online, uh, on mobile devices, and one-third um, on, on laptops and computers, desktops. And at any given time, let's say there are 100,000 people online around the world, and if you're learning between two languages, say Spanish and English, uh, they can do an experiment instantly. They can take two beginners, half of them you teach them verb before noun, the other half you teach them noun before verb, and you track them for the following three months or six months and see who learns faster. So there are a lot of these things that technology can do that traditional language learning could not do. So there is a tremendous opportunity to use the technology for the kinds of things that you're doing with uh, uh, taking information from one geographical area and making it accessible to people with different uh, mother tongues, for example. Right, right. I really just wanted to, uh, I was inspired by, by things that both of you said um, about winners and losers and the idea that there might be an opportunity to not be a loser in the fourth industrial Re revolution, but also this idea that the information that is produced in Dubai is then available to the broader Arabic speaking world. And I think what's so unique about the conversation we're having today around knowledge is that knowledge, unlike so many other means of production is a true public good in the economic sense of the term, meaning that the more I consume it, it doesn't mean that there's less available to anybody else. And so as we're speaking about a future, rather than have a narrative around winners or losers, what we actually have is the opportunity to truly create a future, which is winners and winners. And I just find that to be such a profound concept as we go into these conversations around what the opportunity space actually is for the societies that we're trying to build. Thank you. Can I, can I add just one, uh, one more thing? Because I, don't, I do not want to, uh, I, this has to be clear. I think English is a 21st century skill. It is like basic math. Everyone has to speak it to be able to transact in it. But consuming knowledge is different and it has to happen in local languages. And if you allow me, if you allow me, um, a data that I find fascinating in terms of the importance of creating content and applications, not only providing infrastructure and access, because a lot of the conversations sometimes you gotta provide access, right? You know, access without content and application that is relevant for the user, it means nothing, right? And so one actually has to reinforce the other. But if you think about the 100 sites most visit in Latin America, only 26 of them are local sites, right? In the U.S., out of the 100 sites most visited in the U.S., 88 are Americans, right? I mean, it was created in the U.S. I'm, not, I'm just saying that it's important for us to begin to really think hard about how do you create content and application in our regions? Because this is how we need to develop. And plus, if you create content and application, you will drive penetration of broadband and connectivity. Because right. one leads to the other. And, and I think for years we thought that we'll drive uh, connectivity and then people would come. Well, not really. I mean, you have to, you know, this thing's this issue to go hand on hand in terms of one push the other, right? Sure. Excellent. I do want to bring in the audience. So if there are questions, please uh, do uh, signal. Um, any, any questions from the audience at this stage? Before we turn back to the panel. Yes, sir, uh, over here. Uh, thank you for your inspired speaking. Uh, I'm Khalifa Al Rashidi. My question is uh, as Mr. Ross mentioned, the most uh, powerful resources are financial resources. And I agree with you. Uh, the thing is uh, how we can deal with uh, with the confidentiality of data and outdated data, which is 
the powerful enemy against uh, one who needs uh, the data and develop a research and sharing knowledge. Thank you. Great. We'll take the second question as well. So you, you, you had a question as well. Yes, Mark. How far are we away from a technology which breaks down the barriers of language and allows somebody to look at a document written in one language that reads in their own and listens in a language but hear it in their own? All right. So two questions, one around trust and data and one around the technology uh, availability of uh, multilingualism. I mean, Catherine, did you want to? Multilingualism, the answer is the future is already here. It's just not equally distributed, right? To borrow and paraphrase, not even paraphrase, to steal directly from the famous Gibson quote, the, the um, science fiction author. And, and I mean, I think that this is something that we see in terms of language translation is really, really good for some languages and absolutely terrible for others, in large part because we don't have the corpus available in a digital format to be able to really fully build out these technologies. This is something that Wikipedia actually is really, we're very proud of the fact that all of our data is open and available. And so quite a lot of natural language processing and language translation, machine translation tools actually rely on Wikipedia um, Wikipedia articles to be able to build these interfaces back and forth, but you know, obviously English to French is far superior than Arabic to English, let alone Odia to Malayalam or, or any other pairing of languages. So there's a tremendous opportunity, and I think this actually is an opportunity that speaks to localization, because there's nobody who needs these tools more than local economies, and so there's an opportunity to really think about how to harness local skills to build them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Super. So, so I, I would take the same point, but turn it around in a very different way. One of the questions that comes up with Industry 4.0 is what does it mean to be human in the 21st century? So if, let's say, we reach a point where machines can translate from one language to another perfectly with no barrier, is that a good thing? Uh, as somebody who learned English as a third language, I think it will be terrible if all, all I can speak is only one language. Um, so I think that brings a very different question for the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, as we advance technology, I mean, language um, uh, tr translation is going to get more and more sophisticated, and we're going to overcome the barriers that Catherine just talked about in the next five years or 10 years or something like this. But is that a good thing? So I pose that as a question. Kathy. Uh, yeah, so I think you're all raising some really interesting points. I think that for, from the concept of trust and this idea of, you know, when I've looked at uh, language translation on the internet, so I, I speak four languages, but when I look at it on the internet, I kind of differentiate between which one I trust, if you will, based on who has done it. So it raises another point, I think, that the gentleman was talking about in terms of how do you trust, uh, how do you know what information to trust. So for me, knowledge is information plus trust. So it's getting the information and understanding how to assess and review you know, where it has come from. Um, within the academic communities, we have you know, peer review. So a piece of work is not considered uh, accepted as a broadly accepted piece of work until it's been reviewed by our peers and quite frankly destroyed um, you know, <laughs> destroyed everything about us as well. Um, but uh, so it's how do, we, how do we curate an expert network that helps us to identify which pieces of information, which sources of information can be trusted. And that, you know, you may have a very broad community of people that would do that. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I, I like the fact that the transformation maps are being made publicly available, because I think that will help build that community and, and provide one of those reference points. Abdul Salam, did you want to come? You know, I, I, I want to comment. I mean, I'd like to answer in Arabic. I don't know if we have headsets uh, for everyone to, to translate. Uh, because that would be a live example of, uh, you know, a lot is lost in translation, but uh, you get the gist. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just have it to, good. So, I'll tell you, the issue today is not just about localizing uh, or translating to Arabic international uh, knowledge. The most important thing is to give communities the skill to produce in their, in their own language. In the past, Al-Ma'moon, the Caliph Al-Ma'moon, when he started the movement of translation, 
organized a competition and said that all those who came to us having translated a book, they would be given the weight of the book in gold. After a while, a minister came to the caliph and said, writers are cheating. He asked how, and he, the minister said that they're writing on big pages using a big font so that they have heavier books. And he answered, either way, let them continue because what they are giving us is a lot more valuable than what we are giving them back in gold. The issue of localization is an entry point to the production of content in our own language. When we say that we want uh, a space industry, a science industry, we have a minister in uh, artificial intelligence, a minister for science, we have a movement for a renaissance in our region, and it's not just through translation. Translation is the starting point to develop what we have to catch up on what on the time lost and to produce in our own uh, language. Oh, astrology was uh, produced in Arabic initially, and this is why stars and galaxies have Arab uh, names that have been translated from Arabic. This is the language uh, where uh, sciences were produced. So, a lot of the sciences, a lot of the blood, uh, of the sorry, uh, medicine, uh, like uh, blood circulation, etc., were produced in Arabic. So the issue is not translating to Arabic, but equipping ourselves to produce in Arabic. Beautiful. Thank you. Any final question from the from the audience before I ask my final question to the panelists? No more questions? Brilliant. Well then, in closing, I would like to ask each panelist to uh, just, as we are discussing here over these two days, um, the role of technology in making our global systems, transforming our global systems for the better. Um, I was wondering what each of the panelists thought was their one aspiration for technology when it comes to knowledge. What's, what's their one aspiration? We just heard that uh, Subra, you don't find uh, easy translation, seamless translation, so that we all just speak one language. It's not what you aspire to. Uh, but I'd like to hear from each of you what's the one thing uh, that you would aspire to from technology uh, to enable um, a more uh, empowering uh, environment for knowledge in the future. I think technology is providing us an opportunity to access and also assimilate a diversity of information in an unprecedented way, at an unprecedented pace and volume. I think that's so exciting. But I would try to balance that also with, I think, one of the ways in which we've made, as a human race, enormous progress is we need to have the time and the patience to push the boundaries of human intellect. So let's take an example of proving Fermat's last theorem, which was unproven for 200 years, and all of a sudden, because of 20 years of hard work, somebody proves it. That pushes the boundary of human intellect. If we always ask the question, is the knowledge, does the knowledge have monetary value in the next six months or a year, um, I think we will lose out in the long run. So one of the things we need to be, and, and that requires careful peer review, so fake news and, and patience to carefully vet the information is important. So it's not a simple answer to your question, but on the other hand, I think uh, that's what makes knowledge creation so rich. And uh, one of the roles that academia plays is to have the luxury of asking those questions over a long time horizon. Companies come and go, but I, universities hopefully stay for centuries, so. Thank you, Subra. Catherine. I, I mean, I think that one thing that I've heard repeatedly throughout my time here is really about keeping the human at the center, right? We don't, the reason we're doing this work is in service of humans. It is in service of our communities, our nations. It's in service of humanity as a whole. And so finding a way to keep the human at the center, but then also I think that what technology is really powerful for is it can help us elucidate where the gaps are in our knowledge and where the gaps are within our systems themselves to understand 
how we might address them better to create a world in which there is greater knowledge equity and then hopefully the ability to advance humanity. Thank you. Catherine. Yeah, so I guess uh, from my perspective, what I'd really like to see is that I would like to see it increasing the resilience of society rather than increasing the fracture lines. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, recently we've seen a lot of technical, social media, all of these kind of big things being used to create great divisions in our society. So I would like to see that technology is applied to increase our resilience and also, you know, if, from the human perspective as well, so our resilience towards one another. So. Thank you. Luis. Well, I just think that we went through this, you know, paradigm shift of, you know, technology being a sector to technology being pervasive and transforming every sector. The question here is that are we going to really uh, achieve the ultimate goal, which is social inclusion? I mean, are we going to be able to really transform the world and be a lot more equal, a lot more, you know, inclusive? And I think this is the, this is the thing that I don't sleep thinking about. I mean, are we going to really have a chance now to do it differently, to be a lot more inclusive? Or are we going to just accelerate the pace of exclusion? you know, bringing technology into the picture and then, you know, being... So, so this is, I think, the fundamental conversation for us here. So, well, yes, there was a paradigm shift, which all of us are excited about, right, from a sector to transforming every sector. The question is that, is the, is the end goal of this going to be the same or is it going to be different, right? Are we going to be able to be a lot more inclusive as we do that? I think this is the fundamental challenge, and, and I think this is... We'll see, right? I mean, I don't, none of us actually right now know about it. All right. I, I want to build on uh, Louise's point. I believe the technology has helped us uh, become, uh, as the, the cliche, uh, a, 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 a global village. Uh, and it created a platform where everyone interacts and you feel you're part of this global family. I think technology, and I, th I, th I see it happening, uh, I think it needs to strengthen local communities, smaller communities, where you find sense of purpose, where you find uh, your sense of identity uh, in wanting to contribute to that community because it is the accumulation, the accumulation of, of these communities that will create the prosperity of, of countries, especially when there is disparity, especially when there is this big gap in, uh, in knowledge and ability and you feel in some parts of, of our region that you are at a disadvantage when you are competing with the world rather than strengthening your, your local communities. Language is at the heart of that, and if technology can help us uh, make knowledge available in Arabic, so this is what I hope it could do. Brilliant. Thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring discussion. Let me just, in closing, uh, reiterate that as we are convening here a global network of experts, that is really what has inspired us over the past years to develop this platform that could bring this diversity of thought, diversity of perspectives into an ongoing experience as a digital platform. And we're extremely grateful for all the contributions that many of you here in the room on the panel uh, have made to this, uh, to this effort. As Catherine has said, uh, we believe that knowledge is a global good, is the perfect global good. And uh, uh, in this sense, uh, we're extremely pleased that um, at the occasion of this summit, uh, we'll make this platform publicly uh, available, as was mentioned. Uh, we now have the opportunity here um, to interact uh, in a more informal way after this panel uh, in these uh, four uh, breakout groups uh, behind you uh, with some of the key contributors. We have uh, many with us here uh, in this session and in this summit, and uh, we hope that it, it will indeed inspire a deep and uh, engage dialogue about uh, the, uh, creating uh, a better future. So thank you very much for this, and uh, we'll transition to the informal part of the session. Thank you.